34, and I can't believe that we've made it to the end of the first five books of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, and uh, here we are on the doorstep of heading up into Matthew. Now, one of the ver verses that I want to read for you, and some of you have heard this verse before, it's from Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1. In Isaiah 38, 1, uh, God sends a prophet to a king named Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was a righteous king, uh, and who happened to be very ill at the time. And the message to the king was, and it's pretty uh, direct, the message was, put your house in order because you are going to die. Now that's, uh, that's direct, but it's actually a great reminder to all of us. Um, the day that we're not gonna be here anymore is coming. We don't know when it is. Um, and yet, that call, put your house in order because you're going to die, is a relevant call. And ultimately, the, the best way to prepare for our, our upcoming death is to be reconciled to Christ. That's, that's all, one of the, the most important things a person can do, is not, not just fill out a will and make sure you have your life insurance paid up, but ultimately, the, when, when we look at the, the, the scripture's call to put our houses in order, there is a there is a reminder and, a, and an appeal to be reconciled to God. The reason I mention Isaiah 31 to start is because in chapter 32 and in 34, uh, Moses is reminded, and it might seem harsh, and I, that's I'm going to try to explain it today. Moses is reminded um, that he's going to die. He's going to die while on the doorstep of the land, the physical land promised to his forefathers. And God has told him, and now God is reminding him, that you are not going to enter the land. I, God says to him, I'm going to let you see the land, but you can't enter it. And so, and in fact, that very day, uh, when we come into chapter 32 to 34, Moses um, writes a song, he, by, led by the Holy Spirit. He pens a song that the people were to learn and to sing to remind them to stay faithful to God. And, and then when we're told that at that very day, God says, come with me, and they go up a mountain, to, and, and Moses goes up a mountain, Moses is then given a, a vista uh, of, the, of the land that, that God had promised the people, and then it says that, God, that Moses dies that, that exact day. If you, so if you read that, and you're like, well, why? Moses is like the hero, right? Um, why does the hero uh, not get to enter into the land that he just spent the last 40 years leading the people towards. And so, I'll just go back one. Um, and so, so we, so part of us, some of our feelings are stirred and we ask ourselves, well, is, is God really fair? Like that doesn't seem fair to me, we sometimes would say. How come the hero um, gets stopped short of the goal and, and he, he gets, why does he have to die and rather than be able to step his feet into the, into the land that he'd been leading the people to? Well, the answer, and I'm gonna, I'll look at the answer today, and it's very fascinating, but let me read to you from verse 48. Maybe you might have it in your paper Bible or on your app. Chapter 32, verse 48, it says, On that same day, after writing this song, the Lord told Moses, Go up to the Abiram range to Mount Nebo in Moab, across from Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites, as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. And then the answer is, this is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness amongst the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. Now, like I said, on some levels, this sounds, what God says, sounds pretty shocking. Because we're like, well, what did Moses do that was so bad that, that this is the consequence? Uh, why, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, the good deeds of Moses outweigh the, the bad thing that he did. We think like this, don't we? And then we also throw in the whole, well, I thought God was gracious and loving card, right? Um, and, and, and so how do we step back to say, hey, God is right, 
um, and I'm going to agree with God rather than the, my feelings that are stirred up inside of me, which kind of questions why does it sound so like God's being so harsh? And the fact is, is God's not being harsh, but why does it sound like that to my ears? Um, and so the, in the answer, God says the answer is, he's, he says to Moses, he says, and it's a pretty serious charge, he says, you broke faith with me. Uh, and so to figure it out, we have to go back a little bit. And in Deuteronomy, in Numbers, so if you look with me in Numbers, in Numbers chapter 20, the incident that God references um, is, is unpacked for us. So in Numbers chapter 20, uh, it says, in the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived um, at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. So just in terms of context, this is one thing actually that was kind of new to me. I thought this was years back, but it actually wasn't years and years ago. It was one year prior. So one year uh, before Moses dies on the mountain, this is when this, this incident happens where God says, you broke faith with me, and because you dishonored me in front of all the people, you, you are not, a, not allowed to enter into the physical promised land. Um, and, it says, and so Miriam died and was buried. It says, now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and they said, if only we had died when our brothers fell before the Lord. So they weren't exactly really that grateful. Um, why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take your staff, that you and your and then you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together, and then speak to that rock. So there's obviously was some rock that was in the middle of the community that was visible to all. Speak to the rock that is before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. And so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. And he and Aaron, who was his brother, gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. And so why, what, what sin did Moses commit? Uh, the sin is here unpacked, and, and to grasp uh, the, the, the depths of it, it we, we see that, first off, we understand that it's one year to go. They're 39 years in uh, to the wilderness uh, journey from God delivering them, and it was Moses who confronted Pharaoh, was, and God had given Moses a staff um, that, had, that uh, you know, sometimes when Moses, when Moses struck the bank, the water parted, and so people had come to associate Moses' staff with God's miracle working power. Uh, and then there's Aaron, who's Moses' brother, and, and, but the, and the two of them are leading Israel. Aaron becomes the priest, and Moses is the leader, and so for the last 39 years, they've been leading them. The people um, were sometimes grumbled about things and weren't very happy that they were in the wilderness. And so here we are. Now the other, the backstory is, is the people really shouldn't have been grumbling because every day God sent manna from heaven. Um, and every, any time an enemy had come, God had delivered them from their enemies. Uh, their, their shoes, they had not had to go to, to uh, uh, the store to buy shoes in 39 years. The Bible says that their, their, their clothing didn't wear out. Their sandals didn't wear out. Uh, and so everything they needed, God had provided along the way. Uh, and yet they still weren't happy. 
Uh, and so Moses and, and Aaron, they do the right thing. They go talk to God about this. God says, I want you to go and speak to the rock. Take your staff, go speak to the rock, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to perform a miracle. And I'm going to provide, once again, um, for my people. And yet things go horribly wrong um, because instead of speaking to the rock, it says Moses strikes the rock. Uh, and in order for us to understand what was so wrong about what Moses did, one, he disobeyed God. We're told repeatedly, obey God, don't freestyle, um, don't, uh, don't take away from the word of God, don't add to the word of God. And if God says to do something, then we're supposed to do it the way God tells us to do it. And so, first thing is, Moses outright disobeys a, a very clear command of God. Uh, secondly, um, Moses actually made it about him that day. Uh, and, and, and Moses, you know, he did. The Bible says he was one of the most humble men on earth. Uh, he was, and don't get me wrong, he was a godly man who followed the Lord and who was faithful. But this day, things were not going well for him spiritually. Uh, because he goes and talks to God and says, hey, the people are complaining to me and the issue is we don't have water. And God says, I'm going I'm to fix that because uh, God had been looking after his people. Um, what does Moses call them? You rebels. Moses is un not happy. He's having a little bit of an outburst. Um, look, you rebels. Now there's irony there. What's the irony? Who's rebelling? Moses. Right. That's, the irony is in Moses' own words. He says, look, you rebels, must we provide water for you? And he strikes the rock twice. And it's actually Moses who's breaking God's commands at this point, and it's Moses who's in a position of rebellion. Uh, and it looks like it's Moses who's making the provision for the people. And so who's supposed to get the glory in everything? And now it looks like Moses is the provider for the people instead of God. So this is how we understand what did Moses do that was so wrong. Now we're starting to see how it all went really wrong uh, and why God, and that, God, God says this is the consequence for you and your brother that day because you took my glory and you made it about you. That's the problem. Um, you, you, you didn't show me as holy that day. The other thing is, is Moses took his staff and hits this rock. Um, there's two things about that. When God creates, how does God create? He speaks. You read Genesis chapter 1, God says, God says, God says, and God says. God speaks and creates. God's going to do a miracle. The miracle is water coming out of a rock. And Moses goes against the entire, the entire pattern of how God does things. When God creates, he speaks. God doesn't hit things when he's making things. And yet Moses oversteps his authority, oversteps his bounds completely, and, and ruins the, the pattern for how God makes things by hitting the rock. And not just hitting it, he hits it twice. And so that's, that's another aspect of it. Then there's something that's, that is even more, it adds a, a, another wrinkle to it. The rock itself is significant. Um, a, the, a, rock, a rock in the scriptures, God is often spoken of as our rock, as one to whom that we go to for protection and for safety and for strength. Um, and this particular rock takes on some symbolism because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, Paul writes by the Holy Spirit, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And so Moses whacking the rock is not a good thing. <laughs> Um, especially when there's an aspect where the rock that accompanies them, the rock is, is, is so there's some, there's a greater offense than what just appears to us on the surface. And so all of a sudden we can start seeing that, hey, you know, when, I'm, when I was thinking that God wasn't fair, 
to Moses, or that God was being was God was being harsh with Moses, or why couldn't God overlook what Moses did? All of a sudden, once we start realizing what's happening there, we're we're like, okay, what Moses did was really really bad, um, and and how the glory belongs to God, and then Moses made it about himself. Uh, all of a sudden, Moses, who we otherwise look very highly up to, we realize when God says. There's consequence for what you did. And, and I'm going to let you see the land, but you're not going to enter into the land. In fact, Aaron had already died. Um, and one of the reasons that Aaron had died was it had to do with that. God calls out both Aaron and Moses that day for being in disobedience to him. But it also fills another um, a word of the Lord because it goes all the way back to when the Israelites spied out the land. And God said, everyone under four, under, was it 20? And everyone, everyone under is going to die. And only Joshua will enter in. So there's another intersection where only Joshua and what's the other guy? Caleb. Caleb, thank you. I always rely on your help. Because <laughs> when you're up here talking, your mind just goes blank sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, so only two guys to enter. And so you're like, why only two guys? How come not Moses and Aaron? Well, we learn out later on why not Moses and Aaron. And so we see God's word coming to pass, and we see it happening in this very odd way. But it, but it goes, but it all boils down to Moses and Aaron, um, their disobedience to God this particular day. Now, there's a number of principles that I want to uh, share with you, um, and there's nine, but they won't take that long. Um, first off, one of the things that you and I often say about sin is, "What is the big deal?" Right? Like we live in a culture now where we're so custom to people just doing their own thing and so when we talk about sin we're like well sin is like when you murder somebody or sin is I don't know now sin is not even when you fire your own justice minister because you want to protect jobs um, you know what I mean it's like we've, we've got this, sl this sliding slope of what we think is right and wrong in the culture and so when you call something sin people are like well it better be something big or it's not that big a deal but the Bible has this rule. It says the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't say the wages of murdering someone is death. It just says sin is what it is. An act of rebellion against God and the consequence, no matter how we grade sin, like a little white lie or, or a half-truth here, or you know, that's not how God looks at things. Uh, it's, he's holy and perfect and just, and he has a standard for entering into heaven, and it's being perfect. How do you and I get into heaven? When the righteousness of Christ is applied to us. Because on our own, we're not getting in. Because we're sinners, and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And so God doesn't change his standards, and he doesn't change it because it's 2019. Uh, and so when we say what's the big deal immediately we have a problem in our own thinking Because we've disregarded God's holiness. We've disregarded God's standards of righteousness and what justice is And so we, that's why we turn to our Bibles and say I need to learn what's right and wrong in the sight of God And I need to bring my life in accord with that if I want to live a life that pleases him. Secondly is um, here's, a, here's something that's actually good for us to know. It doesn't matter who you are God's rules apply equally to everybody. Moses doesn't get a free pass. He doesn't get to say, hey, listen, I, I, you know what? There's the rest of people, and then there's me, Lord. God says, no, my standards apply to you too. Um, there's, there's, a, there's consequence for what you did. Thirdly, um, we're reminded again that the spotlight is never supposed to be on us. When Moses took the staff, instead of speaking to the rock, and he took his staff to people associated with Moses' power. Moses made it about Moses that day. And it wasn't nice Moses, it was angry Moses. who was calling people rebels. It's, it reminds us of the same Moses that knocked off the Egyptian 40 plus, 80 years before. Uh, and he had to run away. It's angry Moses that day who's, who's, who's taken away from a moment that was supposed to be about God's miraculous provision for his people. And so instead, it's Moses taking the spotlight. And you and I are reminded, when someone gives us credit, ultimately, you and I are to deflect that credit, aren't we? 
whatever gifts we have, whatever abilities we have. And God's blessed us all with different abilities and gifts, but we didn't make those gifts. They're, they're all, from, all from the Lord. Uh, number four, good deeds don't outweigh bad deeds. Like I said, you could, you could argue and you say, Moses did this and this and this and this and this and this and this. He was an amazing person. He had one bad day. Only had a couple of bad days, but um, that's our thinking in the culture, isn't it? Somehow, do enough good, it'll somehow outweigh bad in the big cosmic way of thinking. And, the, and God says, no, you, we all have the same problem. We're all sinners, and we're all in need of a Savior, and there's one way to be reconciled to God, and there's one way to have your sins forgiven, and there's one way to be assured that heaven is your home. And it has to do with you humbling yourself before God and confessing your sin and putting your faith in Christ. And yes, it sounds pretty exclusive, but that's God who gets to make the rules. And God says, this is the way to be reconciled to me. And then God says, actually, in the scriptures, God is actually appealing to us and imploring us, be reconciled to me. I have a gift to give you. And it's not because you deserve it. It's not because I ever take a scale and it's like, oh, Todd did 45 good things and 27 bad things, and well, it's okay. That's not how it works. My entrance into God's kingdom, my being right with God, is not because of my righteousness. It's because of Christ's righteousness and Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Number five, uh, Moses, and, and here's the thing. Moses did experience God's grace. We, we actually overlook the fact that um, one, Moses, what, actually, here's the other thing. Moses experienced God's grace in what, way more ways than we, can, than we think. One, what he did was, let's call it in the Bible, a fireable offense, <laughs> right? When you make it about you and you disobey God directly, if you look at the other examples of Scripture of people doing that, some of them didn't make it, <laughs> right? Uh, I think about the, the sons, you know, when Aaron's sons decided they were going to approach God their own way didn't work out for them. Um, and so the fact that Moses got to keep his job for the next year is actually um, evidence of, of God's grace to him. God's grace is also shown to Moses in that um, God says, hey, come on up to the mountain. I want to show it to you. That's God's grace. Um, God's grace is also the fact that Moses is in heaven. Uh, Moses he, while he didn't step foot in the physical land, he's in the, in the real one, the one that you and I look forward to, the, the heavenly land. Uh, another thing, that, and it's, and it's uh, actually I'll skip down to seven, I'll go back up to six. It's kind of cool that he got personally buried by God. It says that in the scriptures. God buried him. Moses dies, heart stops, brain stops. God didn't leave Moses lying on the ground. It says that he, he personally buried Moses. And then a neat little subscript is, is it says, and then God hid his grave. You know why God hid his grave? Because we like to make pilgrimages to things. Mm -hmm. And we like to build shrines to things. And we like to venerate things that we shouldn't be venerating. And so God's like, who knows the, the sin of our hearts, says, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to bury Moses, and you're not going to know where he is, so you can't go build some shrine there to visit every year and worship Moses instead of worshiping me. Uh, and so Moses experienced God's grace. The other thing, and actually this is a really important point, we don't always like what God does in our life, do we? The circumstances of our lives, the things that we face, ultimately we, we, we're told that God is sovereign, uh, which means he's in, he's in charge of everything. God is not responsible for, for evil. We're responsible for sin. God's not. But, but still, we sometimes were like, well, why didn't God do this, and why didn't God do that? And Moses actually had a little bit of a hard time um, about uh, God saying, you're not going to step foot in the land. I'll read it to you. It says in, in, chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 3, it says, at that time I commanded Joshua... Um, you've seen with your own eyes all the Lord your God has done, for, done to these two kings. The Lord will do the same to all the kingdoms over where you're going. Don't be afraid of them. So Joshua for, takes over from Moses. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. And then it says, Mo, these are Moses' words. At that time, 
I pleaded with the Lord, Sovereign Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand, for what God is there in heaven or on, in that little g, what God is there in heaven or on earth, who can do the deeds and mighty works that you do, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, the fine hill country in Lebanon. And then Moses says, but because of you, and these are accusatory words, which he's written down, to the, he blames the people, because of you, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. And then it says, then God says this. He says, that's enough. Don't speak to me any more about this matter. Go up to the top of Mount Pisgah. Look west and north and south and east. Look at the land with your own eyes, since you're not going to cross this Jordan. And then commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he will lead the people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. Moses wasn't, like, he wasn't excited about the fact that he couldn't go. In fact, he wants to tell God about it. And then he, in telling God, he also blames the people, of course. <laughs> uh, and then what does God say to him? The matter is actually settled, and you need to stop complaining about it. Do you and I complain about stuff sometimes? And sometimes we plead with God. Um, you know, Paul pleaded with God three times to take away whatever, my, whatever the issue Paul had. You read in the New Testament three times, I've pleaded with the Lord, and then God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Um, you know, there comes a time when actually this is, when we're like, okay, I don't, I'm struggling with what God is doing, and I'm blaming God, and I'm upset with God, and I want what was, what's in my head. And God says, you can't have it. And actually, and it's pretty clear, God makes it really clear to Moses, you can't have it. And then God says, now you need to drop it because the decision has already been made. Now, does that connect with us on some level? Like, some, like if, if 10 years have gone by and you're still angry with God and you're still complaining about what he did, there could be buried in here the message from God saying, it's been 10 years, you need to drop it. And you need to submit to my, my sovereignty. And you need to keep your eyes fixed on me. And you need to understand that I love you, and I know what's best for you, and that everything works out for the good of those who love me. Please learn to trust me, is what God is saying. Um, and so, so for all the long-standing, God didn't do this for me, if all of a sudden, all a whole bunch of time, this little message where God says, let it go and trust me. We're, we do complain. Like, Moses himself complained. But there comes a time when we got to say, God, I'm going to trust you with my life, and I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on you, and I'm going to walk with, walk with you, because I know that you're my heavenly Father, and you have what's best, best for me. Uh, and then, we're almost done. Um, like I said, despite his sin, Moses was an amazing man, a godly man, who we look up to. We mustn't forget that. We focused on the sin of Moses that kept him out of, out of stepping his feet in the land, he was a godly man. Um, the other thing is, is uh, and actually, um, how do we, and then with the last point is, Moses is where we are, is we want to be. Moses is in heaven. How do we know Moses is in heaven? Well, we think to the scene of the transfiguration of Jesus. I think it's John 17. Um, and Jesus shows his glory, he takes Peter, James, and John, and shows them his divine and heavenly glory. Who appears? Moses and Elijah. Moses made it, didn't he? He didn't get to step physically into the land, but he stepped into the heavenly one, didn't he? That's where you and I are looking forward to being. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Uh, this world is not our home. Heaven is our home. Uh, and despite all the troubles of this life, the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, the, the author and finisher of our faith, our salvation, the one who willingly went to the cross. Why did Jesus willingly go to the cross? For the joy of our salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins. And so we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we're mindful as his followers that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And Moses is where we want to be. He's with Christ. And so we, we say, Lord, help me to stay faithful. Help me to trust you in my life and walk in, in a manner that brings the glory to you.
Let's stand together as we sing our closing song. And uh, I picked this closing song because in, there's an amazing verse in, um, go ahead, the next slide. Uh, there's an amazing verse in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33, it says, There is no God uh, like the God of Jeshurun. Jeshurun is another name for Israel, um, who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds of his majesty. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. We're going to sing a song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. This is where the song comes from uh, when it references the everlasting arms of God.